This week we talk to Rob Swigert, who brings prehistory to life in Mixed Harvest, Stories from the Human Past. In some ways, things haven't changed that much. Every technology that we develop creates a whole plethora of new remedial technologies that have to make up for the problems caused by the previous technology. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley. Caroline is not joining us today, but um, she will be back soon. We have a really interesting short story collection today, and the author is Rob Swigert. Hope I said the name at least partially yes. correctly. Totally correct. <laughs> All right. And Rob is a former technology journalist, technical writer, computer game designer, poet, futurist, archaeology writer, pilot, driver, Aikido black belt, parent, rumpus room manager, and he's currently a fiction writer, grandparent, and sometimes an urban rambler, which I'm a little curious what that means. And this book is Mixed Harvest, Stories from the Human Past. Welcome to Writer's Voices, Rob. Thank you very much, Monica. Glad to be here. <laughs> so you have a lot of things listed there as what you formerly were. Aren't you doing any of those anymore? Uh, I'm a little <laughs> bit retired from most things that are too strenuous for my age. Ah. So uh, grandparenting is uh, strenuous enough. It is. And, it is. Uh, urban urban rambling is still fun. And what exactly is urban rambling? Well, if I could go into other cities, I would be wandering around. <laughs> I, my favorite city is Paris. My second favorite city is Istanbul. Oh, wow. And how uh, many well, times have you been to each of those? Well, I used to have an apartment in Paris, so I was there a lot. Uh, Istanbul probably... Ten times. And what took you to so many places? Was it work or was it? Itchy feet. Itchy feet. <laughs> uh, I, I, w I was a Philhellene when I was young. I just worshipped everything about Greece. And uh, that was the first, pretty much the first place I went. I'd been to Paris a few times during college. But uh, after college, I went to Greece. And then I went back to Greece and taught English for a while, and uh, was quite interested in classical archaeology uh, because there are quite a few ruins there. You um, know, I've been to Greece a couple of times, and what always amazed me, because I've been to Europe quite a few times, and in Europe, you walk around and you see these statues, um, you know, and buildings and things that that are hundreds of years old. But yeah. in Greece, they're thousands of years old. They are indeed. And in central Turkey, they're many thousands of years old. Oh, wow. And in the caves of uh, France and Cantabria and Spain, they're tens of thousands of years old. So we've been around for a while <laughs> as, as human beings. And obviously, uh, this is something that has always been of interest of, to you and is really what Mixed Harvest Stories from the Human Past is about. Tell us what you, why you wrote this book and what it is. Uh, okay. The, initially, the first archaeology book I wrote was a book called uh, Shibalba Gate, a novel of the classic Maya. I had been spending a lot of time in Central America in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, and I wrote this novel that got published as a textbook novel uh, for people studying Mayan archaeology. And I was on a an archaeology tour in Turkey in 1999, uh, looking at classical archaeology, Greek and Roman. But we stopped at Çatalhöyük, which is a uh, Neolithic settlement in central Anatolia. And the place blew me away. It was so weird. These tiny little uh, square houses that were built up right next to each other. So the only entrance was through the roof. And the entrance was both the entrance and exit and the chimney. So there was a um, an oven right below the uh, 
entrance and the smoke from the oven would go up there or fill the house. And I just couldn't imagine why people would live in something like this. It's a kind of Pueblo similar to, uh, you know, the Southwest, but um, much darker. And it seemed to me quite a gloomy place to be. And I, I thought it was just odd that people lived in that. Okay. And I did a novel. Wait, ho- hold on. That. Hold on just a second. The entrance was the only way to come in was through the roof. Yes. And there was a fire right, right below right it. it. And there's, well, it's a little bit uh, set to one side, but. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's basically right below it. The, the, the so, entrance would actually be in the south. Uh, let me think. South west, southeast side. And there'd be a ladder and the oven was sort of in the middle. So the smoke would go over and up. Now there must have been how about on the outer perimeter of all these houses? Were there other entrances on the outer perimeter? I don't believe there's any evidence of entrances uh on the ground floor or windows even. Oh, wow. I think I think basically that was it. Um, the you know most of them are ruins because they would uh, build the house and live in it for a hundred years, and then they would knock the house down and take all the clay bricks and smash them up and make nice dirt floor for the next level of the house, and then they would build another house on top of that. So they're they're sort of pancake houses flattened and stacked up <laughs> uh, over about about twelve hundred years. So it was very very strange to me. Um, and I think what was remarkable about the trip was that it started with um, uh, we went to uh, central Turkey and and watched the eclipse in August of ninety nine. And then we stopped sort of in the middle at Chatalhoyuk, and then we were on the coast, and the earthquake struck Istanbul, and uh, tens of thousands of casualties. And it just struck me that these kinds of natural phenomena, which we can explain today, must have been very weird and mysterious and terrifying to people who didn't have the science we have to explain it. And uh, I got fascinated by uh, by the early parts of human history when we discovered the world and came to understand how things would work and then developed what we call civilization, which so, I'm less inclined <laughs> to call it. <laughs> ah, yeah, really. So in Mixed Harvest, you're starting with with a story. There's like three story cycles in this book. If I got that right? Okay. And the first one is what we would call prehistoric times. Um, Yes. So tell us a little bit about what time period that is and why you chose to set the cycle in that time. Well, I'll just backfill a little uh, uh, data about how I got started on this. So I I did a novel about uh, the Neolithic, another textbook novel. And I was invited to come to a series of seminars at Chakalhoyuk uh, over the course of three years, which purportedly was about the role of religion in the origin of cities. Uh, but I thought if we're going to talk about the origin of religion, we have to go back before the Neolithic to see how that changed when we started living in, in settlements and permanent houses. And then what happened when we got cities and how religion changed. In that period. So I started going back in time to uh, somewhere roughly around 60,000 years ago, let's say. And uh, when the when the uh, continent and Asia as well were were, uh, populated, not heavily populated, but had uh, humans called Neanderthals. And now we know Denisovans as well. And uh, how did they live? How did they move around the world? How did they get their resources? How did they hunt? How did they interact with each other? And it, this was really the time when we were beginning to understand that Neanderthals and humans uh, mated and had children. And now even I have a little bit of Neanderthal DNA. 
And I found this really exciting. I thought that, that's a lot of fun. We've thought about the Neanderthals as these dumb, brutish, uh, slope, uh, forehead, uh, idiots. And it turns out that they actually were, uh, human. So we can't, we can't look down on them anymore because we are partly them. And, uh, the evidence that we have from this prehistory, as you say, is mostly artifacts, some uh, archaeology from caves and places where people camped, uh, mostly, as they used to say about archaeology, it's, it, it's the three worst professions in the world. It's grave digging, garbage collection, and <laughs> looting. <laughs> And um, uh, the paintings in the caves, which is what I found so remarkable, uh, led me to visit uh, a lot of caves in France and Spain. And the uncanny accuracy of the paintings of animals and animal behavior is so far beyond what I could imagine people at that time could have done. That you realize that we are, uh, there's something unique about us in the world in terms of what we could do cognitively. And it, they, because they were painted in places that were totally inaccessible, they must have been there for, uh, reasons of, um, what we would call, I guess, human development. Uh, I, one of the, uh, anthropologists on the trip would talk about scaring the crap out of teenage boys, uh, which was something that seems to be pretty universal. Uh, these rights, uh, initiation rights to bring boys into adulthood, uh, partly probably as a way of controlling their aggression. And, uh, but, but the, but the observation of the animal world is quite astounding. And that period lasted until uh, about 14, 12,000 years ago. So that was a long stretch of time when we were uh, basically uh, natural philosophers uh, or naturalists who had studied the world around us, of which we were a part. And what happened when we hit the uh, Neolithic and farming emerged was that we began to separate ourselves from the natural world. And uh, we have pretty much alienated the world from us and us from the world. And that's where we're in trouble today. I think I covered it. <laughs> You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. Our guest today is Rob Swigart, and his book is Mixed Harvest Stories from the Human Past. Now, I noticed that... A lot of the stories focus, um, kind of the main characters are female. Was well, that... that's half the human race. <laughs> it's true. But was that a conscious choice? Uh, I think it was at least semi-conscious. I, I have two daughters, so mm. I've, the children I've known in my life the best have both been female. Uh, so I probably am interested. Also, it just seems to me one of the, one of the things that emerged during the, uh, what I call the sedentary divide, this period when we adopted agriculture and changed our way of life so completely, uh, is that we, um, created, uh, social hierarchies and, uh, patriarchy and in particular, uh, the, the, uh, the real oppression of women or the control of women. Uh, they, they've always had ways of kind of fighting back, but, um, politically it's been, um, to the detriment, I think, of mankind. And if you look at hunter-gatherer societies, even the ones today, like the Hadza in Tanzania, uh, there's a lot of equality when you're a hunter-gatherer. Uh, there's a somewhat division of labor. Usually the men are the hunters and the women are the gatherers and they take the children with them. But there's a lot of equality in, in their social relations and their control over their own bodies. 
And uh, that gradually changed as agriculture emerged. And I think I understand somehow the process that we underwent when that happened. But uh, uh, it's oh. something that seems to be in the process of reversing, maybe slightly. I'm I'm I hopeful. Hope. But tell me a little more. Let's delve a little more into this. Why agriculture would have... Um, contributed to that change or furthered that, that change in repressing women and the, pa- okay. you know, the getting, rise of patriarchy. Of re- yeah, there's a lot of research on this, but uh, my, f- my sense of the story is that uh, something happened to the climate, as we know, called the, uh, the Holocene, which ended the, uh, the previous period, the, the, the Paleolithic uh, Pleistocene. And uh, things got warmer and much more lush, and uh, the environment was became extremely friendly. And the result was that people discovered that they didn't have to travel as far to get their daily meal or their yearly meals. They could uh, stay in one place, and the plants would grow around them. So they started to settle down, and they were building little houses, round initially, uh, like they're natural ones, more or less. And uh, when they started to take, when it started to take root, as it were, and the uh, crops were growing around them, and they started to learn how to domesticate animals, the houses became more permanent. And there was a period there in the Neolithic, the second phase of the Neolithic, ne- Neolithic when the houses became square. Uh, my vision of this is that the corners of the roundhouses grew out to meet each other and make more room. Uh, I read on uh, Wikipedia one time, I think, that uh, the reason for square houses is because furniture fits in it better. <laughs> I, I, I think that's probably not quite correct. <laughs> but um, uh, the, um, the house then lasted more than a generation. So when a house lasts more than a generation, there are problems that arise, one of which is who in the next generation gets the house. Mm. And that meant that um, the, uh, the, the boys, uh, the boys were fine, but the, the girls, the, the, the wife had to be controlled. You had to understand that she was the real mother of the um, next generation. So it began to emerge that men would uh, watch women more carefully to make sure that the heirs, because inheritance becomes becomes a thing. And, okay. Uh, because obviously, very, yeah, obviously, a woman's beginning. a woman's child is her child, but a man can never be totally sure. Exactly. So he's got to keep a sharp eye on it. Um, I I'm pretty sure that. Up until then, nobody cared much because every member of a tribe, of a not tribe, before tribes, every member of a band was essential to the survival of the band. And nobody would much care who the father or the mother was. You know, it's uh, like Hillary Clinton's book. It takes a village. It takes a whole band to raise the children. And uh, I have a tendency perhaps to idealize that period because – it seems to have been relatively peaceful and quite and uh, quite uh, uh, res- uh, rich in resources. People did well, uh, but when you start farming, uh, you're crowded together. The villages grew in size. More people uh, uh, re- required more food. More food required more people to farm. More people to farm meant more children. More children meant uh, more crowded conditions. More crowded conditions meant more diseases jumping from domesticated animals to people and higher infant and uh, maternal mortality. And uh, we got a kind of runaway population. And then you start uh, cutting down the forests in order to clear the land for farming. And uh, you end up with monocultures and Monsanto. So... (laughs) I think so. Direct path from um, early agriculture and 
how many years BC to Monsanto? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the earliest agriculture was probably the, a, a group called the Natufians in um, the Levant, uh, I think around 12,000 years ago, let's say, or, or at the very earliest 14,000 years ago. There was a little cold snap that sort of disbanded farming for uh, a thousand years or so. And then farming really started to take off. The interesting thing is that it did that everywhere in the world, including uh, on in the Americas. So farming is seems to be inevitable when you get the right conditions for it. And I'm not suggesting that we could avoid it. I am suggesting that we look at it now, look back at it now as a way of understanding uh, where the unintended consequences started to emerge. And I think the social inequality is one of the unintended consequences, uh, patriarchy, uh, but empires, warfare, slavery, money, capitalism, you know, they all, they're all direct consequences. And climate change, because with, uh, dry farming in the Near East and wet farming in the Far East, uh, we have gradually increasing CO2. In, with dry farming and methane with uh, wet farming, rice farming. So we've started, we started the process of climate change back then, which we had put on top of natural climate change. I was going to say, so essentially climate change caused farming to start and now climate change could be the end of farming. I think that's a very good way of putting it. <laughs> wow. Of course, the end of farming is, would mean the end of civilization as we know it. I think the uh, jury is out. Mm. Well. Okay, so let's go back to um, mixed harvest. What are the three time periods that you're writing about in this book? Okay, the first section is called uh, Shelter. It's uh, when we were hunter-gatherers, uh, all of us. And I think at the beginning of the Holocene, the population of the world, you know, you have to estimate these things, was probably no more than 25 million. And uh, we are now all approaching 8 billion. Uh, so it's been incrementally increasing, especially recently. Uh, we lived in we lived in shelters. We found uh, rock overhangs, or we built lean-tos, or um, teepees, or tents, or in the Ukraine, I think they built houses out of mammoth skulls and mammoth bones, sort of domed, maybe like yurts. Uh, so they're just shelters. They're temporary. They dissolve back into the landscape when you leave. Uh, so we weren't making a big impact on the uh, on the planet in general. When you get to this uh, period when small uh, settlements grew into little villages, which grew larger into places like uh, Chateau Hoyuk at the height of the Neolithic, uh, there were pro there were between four and eight thousand people in this place. And uh, I call that period house because the houses became square and permanent. And the square house, by the way, is very important because it's changed our perception of the world. Uh, in, so in what way? Of, in what way? Well, straight lines. And don't get me started. I've written about this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got to uh, give straight, me a little more. Straight lines versus straight curves. Line, okay, okay. A, a little aggression here on straight lines. Okay. Um, in the natural, in the in the the natural way you do it out now with a capital N in the natural world, there there are very few really straight lines. There are some, there's some straight plants. And uh, if you look at a, a body of water, you get the, the horizon will be a straight line. But there aren't very many. And people navigated around the world with uh, landmarks. You know, you look at uh, a mountain peak or a big rock or a river or uh, something in the world that separates it from other things and you can navigate your way around that. 
Uh, but when you start building square houses, it turns out to be very convenient, like farming, and so quite tempting. And from a straight line, well, we have to talk about remedial technology. I guess I'll do that. If you build a wall, you can block out the wind, but you also can't see what's on the other side of the wall. So you have to do something which we call a remedial technology, which is put a window in the wall. But now it doesn't block out the wind. So you have to cover, find, make something that covers the window. And it goes on and on like that. Doors, doorways, doors, door coverings. Um, and every technology that we develop creates a whole plethora of new remedial technologies that have to make up for the problems caused by the previous technology. So now we have houses with only one entrance uh, through the roof. <laughs> and uh, you start to see things in terms of uh, uh, straight lines, right, line of sight. And now we think to go from my village to the next village, uh, it would be much easier if I created a road. So you create a road and it's straight. Uh, but a road is a technology, and it creates a problem in that it is also something that divides or separates. So the road has now two sides. And ask any turtle trying to get across a freeway, and he'll tell you that this is not easy. So um, I think that the straight line now dominates, and if we look around our environment, they are everywhere. Straight lines are everywhere. And things that are not straight, like trees, are a little bit unnatural. They don't seem to, they seem to need taming or pruning or something to get them under control. So I think that we've, we've changed our perception of how the world is put together. And, uh, I see this and I think other people, I think a lot of people are seeing this as maybe something we should rethink. Uh, you know, there are architects trying to design curly cue houses or <laughs> non, nonlinear houses. And nonlinearity is uh, an important function in the emergence of complexity. So, uh, I think we've, we've, we for a while maybe lost the spontaneity of the non-straight and hopefully we're going to get that back well hopefully we get it back in a way that we're still here to enjoy <laughs> so that's the second part of the house is is the, is the house part and then when cities emerge which happens in southern mesopotamia in southern iraq uh, these villages grow ever more complex and because uh, the Tigris and Euphrates uh, plain needs to be irrigated to grow crops. Uh, there, there's a, a level of social control that emerges initially from what was called the temple, the Egal. Um, and uh, there had to be some way of organizing uh, workers to dig canals and uh, irrigate large swaths of countryside. So cities are very complex uh, uh, organisms that are based on what is now the home. And that third section is called home, which is the house is now the center of domestic life. Uh, the city is now a place where people actually work. They're surrounded by farms and there are people working them, but the city is full of, you know, uh, metal workers, potters and leather workers and uh, people who carve little, uh, medallions and, and, uh, make pots and pans. Make beer. And make beer, definitely <laughs> make beer, uh, barley beer and, uh, weaving and, um, and construction, of course. So that's where civilization comes in, and with that came the emergence of a system of writing called cuneiform, and I believe that's the first place in the world where writing emerged initially as a way of keeping track of uh, accounts, how many sheep and goats somebody has, and how many you traded for 
how many bolts of cloth and so on. So, uh, and writing is a way of uh, t externalizing memory and increasing the complexity of supervision and organization. And uh, that's when history starts, because now we can read about it. So prehistory, I think, goes all the way up to the beginning of writing, which is about, well, let's say 3000 BC. And um, and now we are where we are. You're listening to Writer's Voices, and our guest today is Rob Swigert, our author of Mixed Harvest. Okay, so we've got these three um, these three sections of the book and I'm just curious because there's you know you were working with the whole breadth of human history but you picked these three very specific points in time was that difficult to to make that choice or was it just obvious to you as you started writing uh, I don't think it was obvi obvious as I started writing but it became obvious uh, because I felt that, uh, you know, the, 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 the how, the settlement phase of humanity. Okay. This is the period I call the sedentary divide. The sedentary divide is before farming, we were hunter gatherers and there was a way of life that was pretty consistently self similar, uh, around the world. Then there was this farming phase when these communities started to grow up and stay in one place. And farming took hold, and it came to dominate. And after that, when cities emerged, things were totally different from the way they were before. So the Neolithic, or the uh, the, the, the period when agriculture emerged, I call the sedentary divide. Before, we were wandering around. Afterwards, we've been sedentary ever since. Now, in that middle section in your book, though, the, the um, inhabitants of these houses did leave and travel when things got difficult was that um then they would go settle somewhere else was that common i think that was common uh you know uh chatal hoyuk which is the biggest and possibly the most famous um lasted about 1200 years and then it was abandoned so uh, it's pretty clear that either conditions were changing, uh, they had depleted the soil. There are all kinds of reasons for uh, people moving. <laughs> we and, have we have this idea that up until like 200 years ago, everybody practiced sustainable agriculture, but sounds like not necessarily. Uh, I would say definitely <laughs> not. Um, the the Middle East, Greece, for instance, completely, almost completely denuded of any forests. Uh, people were using wood for everything from construction east of uh, support beams and so on uh, to cooking fires. Uh, the same happened in the Maya regions. They, they deforested huge parts of it, and uh, then they had to move. Uh, they, at least in the Maya area, they did slash and burn agriculture so they would cut down some forest and grow crops there for a few years and then abandon it so that it would regrow but uh, the population also increased and uh, that made for some problems now in the early sections of the book there's a lot of focus on um, death and burial and how these people treated their dead do you want to talk about that a little bit uh, first of all, I think that, uh, because, uh, archaeology is the study of stuff that people left behind, it is, uh, kind of absorbed by the number of, uh, burials that are available. And because that's what we find. Uh, -huh. uh but I, you know, my feeling has been, there, there's lots of study of it. There's this whole book on the history of, of uh, burial practices, and there are many different kinds. Uh, that it's a san it's a sanitation issue initially. You can't uh, you can't stay very long in one place if the dead bodies are piling up. <laughs> so you have to uh, remove them, 
And initially, I'm sure they were just left where they fell. Uh, but gradually, um, the uh, uh, ideas or beliefs around death and mortality and the way in which we confront our mortality as we come, become more and more aware of it uh, has generated a, a, a number of social um, you know, rituals or customs around uh, burial and beliefs about either an afterlife or uh, uh, what happens to the dead after they're gone. Um, I think that uh, most cultures that I know about, well, the take, take uh, Southern Iraq, the Sumerian culture, and most other cultures, the afterlife is just a kind of gray, uh, boring, uh, low energy place. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people don't have much to do down there. It's not really a sense that they're going to go somewhere and play the harp or, uh, <laughs> you know, live in a house. It's just uh, blah. And it's it's the same in, in the Bible, I think. Um, it's a couple of references to afterlife. But the Sumerian afterlife, you know, they, they you would bury the dead and people would put a... a, a kind of a, a copper tube down into the into the burial so that you could pour beer down it and <laughs> feed the uh give give the dead a little something to perk up their day i guess <laughs> rob do you know are there any non-human animals that bury their dead or dispose of them in some other way uh they i think the elephants it's the only one I can think of off the top of my head. They, they you know, they go to a place and uh, to die, mm. and then other elephants, usually the matriarchs, because it's a matriarchal society, will will mourn, will move the bones around, and and uh, express. Uh, maybe we're projecting onto it, but what else would they be doing? Yeah. I think of ele elephants as, as quite intelligent. Uh, I got to know one once. Uh, was a smart cookie. <laughs> um, so I, I, th I think, and, and I think, uh, 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 primates, chimpanzees will have some, um, interactions with the dead, either anger, males, you know, will take a dead one and pound it on the ground oh um uh but i but but also mourning behavior and mm -hmm. i must say there was that recent story about an orca that carried her dead baby for months oh. so i think that there are uh, uh sort of centers of intelligence in our world that um, have uh echoes of feeling about um what what's other besides this life rob would you like to read from mixed harvest sure uh you want a story or a non-story let's the have a story yeah let's have a story although i do want to mention that before or and or after each story there's a little bit of context that you give yes. to the time period and what was going on in the world at that point yeah uh, the stories I, were meant to be illustrations of important um, kind of social uh, problems that humans solved in one way or another. I was interested in, uh, because uh, Steven Pinker's book, The Better, Better Angels of Our Nature, tried to claim that the, uh, the Paleolithic hunter-gatherer societies were extremely violent. And there's a lot of pushback from archaeologists about that. There's uh, very little evidence of uh, large-scale uh, violence. And uh, it seemed to me that that wasn't the case. Okay. There is a, st there is a short piece about uh, 
place in Spain called the uh, Cima de los Huesos, uh, the Pit of Bones, but it's about uh, 300,000 years ago, uh, pre-modern humans. So I'll read the story about the encounter between a modern human and uh, Neanderthal. This this takes place, uh, let's say, 60,000 years ago, could be 50. And it's called Bringer. She was best among her people at finding food. When her small band praised and gave thanks, she would shake her shaggy head and remind them that she was the same as all bringers, like her mother and her mother's mother, which was as far back as memory would take her. It was no different with the sun and the moon. They came around again and again. The day would bring the smells of coming winter, with clouds tumbling down from the north. But when she left the rest of the women with the little ones and climbed up from the camp, the night was sharp and clear. Brilliant stars pulsed with life in the heavens. She made her way along the ridge, pausing from time to time to sniff. Just before dawn, the wind rose, gusting through the scattered pines and around outcrops of bare rock, a familiar song. At the end of the ridge, she stopped. There was nothing on the air, no scent of either danger or food, but she was bringer and would not return until she had found meat for the new mothers. There was always meat to scavenge. Pale light was seeping through the darkness when it came to her. A brief moment, as the chill wind shifted, a strong blood smell of fresh kill. Deer. It was gone almost as soon as it had appeared. She settled, waiting for the wind to play again, and when it did, yes, the killer was certainly a lion. The trees rustled and cool pines replaced the slaughter somewhere below her. Now that she knew where it was, she had plenty of time. She would allow the lion its right to take the first portion. Soon, certainly by the new moon, she and her band would have to move away from the ice before the heavy snows. But for now in the mating season, there was still food. The males of her band had gone hunting two days ago. They might find something to kill with their spears. But more often than not, it was up to Bringer to find the fresh kills and move in before the other scavengers, the jackals and hyenas, the wolves, and great birds arrived. She picked her way down the slope in the semi-darkness, holding her short wooden shaft with its finely worked flint point, ready to stab or slash. If she was careful, though, it wouldn't come to that. The gusts brought a stronger scent now, and more frequently. She passed through open woodland along the edge of a narrow valley and could hear a small river tumbling from the mountains to the east, where the sun was rising, dimmed by mist. Cloud was spreading, gray and even as the northern ice. The sun was a faint orange disk with little warmth, but it brought her world into view, and she murmured a brief chant of gratitude. Through a break in the willows on the opposite bank of the river, she saw the lioness crouched over a fresh kill. The lioness couldn't hear Bringer over the sound of the river, but when the wind shifted, the beast looked up, blood dripping from her prominent canines. After a moment, she swallowed. A great tongue swiped over her lips, and she lowered herself, chin on her paws, sated, at ease, and unafraid. In her eyes, Bringer saw only cautious curiosity. The tuft of her tail straightened into the air and swayed back and forth. She seemed to grin. The stocky woman and the great cat gazed intently at one another. Then, as if in answer to an unspoken question of her own, the lioness stood, stretched, and with a languid backward glance padded away into the scattered pines. For a time, Bringer could see the faintly striped body ripple behind the trunks. Then it was gone. There were boulders upstream where she could cross but she would be out of sight of her prize, and no matter how brief, she couldn't leave it for a moment. Without hesitation, she took off her leather boots, held up her soft leather skirt, and waded through the water. She was intent on watching the wood for sign of jackal and or hyena, and paid no attention to the biting cold flowing around her knees or the sharp stones on the river bottom. The clearing was silent. 
If another animal had heard the doe scream or the sound of the kill, it was too far away to matter. Once Bringer began butchering, other scavengers would wait until she had finished, for she was human, and unlike the lion, they would be wary of her. She climbed the low bank and turned her attention to the doe. The body was lacerated, one flank half-eaten, but enough remained to feed her small band for several days. She was Bringer. She couldn't go fetch the men, for they were hunting. Bringing the women here, burdened as they were by the little ones, would take all day, and such a prize would not remain untouched. She could feel eyes in the trees. By the time she returned with the others, there would be nothing left. She would carry back to her people as much of the meat as she could. She glanced up at the dim disk of the sun. She could taste ice on the gusts swirling down the slope. She set to work with her stone blade, cutting the meat from the bone in strips and laying them out on a grassy piece of leather. She worked with her back to the river. Any real danger would approach from the trees on this side. Her pale hands worked deftly, slicing, cutting through the joints, and pulling away strips of sinew. She bundled them all together with the internal organs, the heart, kidneys, and liver, stood up, and slung the heavy burden over her shoulder, leaving her hands free. Only then, when she turned to cross the river once more, did she see the stranger on the other shore. She stopped, boots in one hand, blade in the other. The stranger was strange indeed. It appeared to be a fully grown male, though far too tall and dark like the night. He held two long pointed shafts in his right hand. His surprise was as obvious as hers. Neither his height nor his sooty color was the strangest thing about him. No, it was his clothing and the long black braids that trailed down over his shoulders from under a conical leather cap. He wore many layers of leather, and overlapping flaps and strips of different kinds of fur mingled with stra strings of snail shells. He must be awfully hot and uncomfortable under all those wrappings, and the dangling objects would impede him. His coverings made no sense to her. Perhaps it was a female. Despite all this, though, he seemed quite solid and firm, a being of flesh. He might be a man, after all. His mouth moved as if he were speaking. She couldn't hear over the sound of the water and shook her head. Although he didn't seem aggressive, she remained wary. Only when he placed his two spears on the brown grass and opened his hands did she see how unsteady he was, how his body shook. This puzzled her. He was young, and it couldn't be the cold, not with all those coverings. His hands were wrapped in crude mittens. Under those long wooden shafts, using those long wooden shafts must be difficult. In the thirty annual cycles of her life, Bringer had known only the members of her band and the handful of others they came across in their wanderings below the ice. Never had she seen someone with such dark skin and such black hair. Her own was reddish-brown, drawn back and chopped off at her neck. Why would he need to cover his head? It wasn't winter yet. He had a friendly expression, though, what she could see of it. She didn't quite trust his smile, but it was open and puzzled, so she asked, What are you? The stranger frowned, putting a mitten to his ear. She shook her head. Of course, you can't hear. She crossed the river, came close to him, and stared at his face. It was like one of her people, but not the same. His forehead was too flat, his head too narrow, and his nose was long and thin, not wide and compact like hers. White plumes flowed from it with each breath. Surely with a face like that his people would mock him. He had almost no chin. But his eyes were large and liquid brown. When he looked past her across the river, and they widened, she turned to look. A hyena was ripping at the remains of the deer. She shouted, but it paid no attention. A second hyena was trotting down from the trees. She turned back to him and shrugged. His answering shrug upset his balance, for he staggered a step or two. He tried to wave it off, but before she could stop him, he sat down hard on the ground. A wave of pain passed over his face. She bent down and breathed into his nostrils. His eyes rolled up, and with a long sigh, he toppled back. A spasm passed down his body. What was she to do? When the day ended, the other women would be waiting, but she hesitated to leave him. 
Though she owed him nothing, he needed her help, and it was the way of her people to help anyone in need, even strangers. People were few and must be cherished. Even this odd-looking looking figure was a person. Strong as she was, she couldn't carry him up the ridge and all the way back to camp. Besides, she had the meat already freezing in its wrappings to bring to her people. The men would be out hunting for two or three more days, and the young ones would be hungry. She straightened him out, so when his eyes opened, he would see the clouds. She examined his point pointed wooden shafts. They were much longer than the ones the hunters in her band used, but the tips were not stone, merely fire-hardened wood. As a precaution, she moved them to the river bank. If it came to a conflict between them, he may be taller, but she was certainly the stronger even if he had been well-fed and fit. She'd seen skin like this, though not so dark, drawn tightly over cheekbones many times before. He was a man close to starvation. She collected some fallen wood. She took from her pouch the fire-starter tinder she always carried. In moments she had blown it into life and fed it the wood. Aromatic pine smoke shredded away across the river. It disturbed the hyenas, and they looked up briefly. He did not stir when she rolled him onto the bed of ferns she prepared. She dropped a few rounded river stones into the fire. When they were hot, she used two sticks to move them into the water skin she had slung over a branch, and then she set some strips of meat and a handful of leaves collected from along the river bank to simmering. The stranger's breathing was shallow and so slow, she thought for a moment he was about to leave his body. She twisted a lock of the hair going down to the thick ridge over her eyes, deep in thought. She dripped warm water onto his mouth. Nothing happened. The sky was now the color and texture of hard mountain stone. The sun was no longer visible. The snows would come earlier than usual, within a few days. They would have to move again as soon as the hunters returned. He made a sound and opened his lips, licking at the water. When the stew was ready... She scooped some into her crude wooden spoon and held it under his nose. His eyes flew open with a snort, and he stared wildly. She tilted her head, watching him closely. This tall, shivering being with dark round eyes, scraggly beard, and peculiar coverings was a puzzle. She was no longer certain he was a real human being after all. Though he felt solid enough, she knew there were some presences in the world that could take physical form. Such things happened all the time. He could be one of those. It was always best to treat such beings, shapeshifters that could appear and disappear, with respect and tend to their needs. One day, <laughs> you might need their help. Rob, I'm going to stop you there because I want to have time to ask you a few more questions. Okay. But that was from the uh, one of the first stories in, yes. in your book, um, Mixed Harvest. Stories from the Human Past. So for the first thing I want to ask is, um, you know, there's so much detail in how these people live their lives in each of these story cycles. And of course, they're quite different. Did you study this in college or was this something you just learned because you were really interested in it? Uh, it's something I learned because I was really interested. I I'm, I'm afraid I do that all my life, and uh, I don't follow one trail. So. Right, and and actually that leads right to the next question, which is looking at your writing background, you have done many different kinds of writing, from technical writing to writing thrillers um, to satire, and this, yep. you know, does Mick, you also mentioned having written textbook novels in the past. Is Mixed yeah. Harvest kind of a textbook novel, too? Um, well, not a novel exactly, but stories that... Well, that... They, I, they, they called it, the publisher called it a novel. And I thought, well, okay, in a certain way it is because it has a kind of arc overall. It's not just a collection of short stories. They They feed one into the other. And I do think of it as a kind of novel of human uh, development up until the beginning of written history. Uh, written history we know about, uh, 
Um, but I wanted to imagine uh, what our species story might be. And it seemed that, uh, you know, we, we emerged in Africa and migrated uh, all over the place, uh, initially uh, probably across Southeast Asia, around uh, the Indian subcontinent and into the islands around Indonesia and Australia, which probably was the first wave of migration. And then a, a second wave. This is conjecture. We don't have solid evidence, but more and more evidence of humans uh, appearing in Europe are, are showing up all the time now. So I think that this is this is a story uh, of how we came to be where we are today. And I'm now really interested in how we're going to have to change to deal with uh, what's coming. Well, yeah. what's here. Now, I'm looking at your website, which is robswigert.com, and that's S-W-I-G-A-R-T for Swigert. And so the earliest book looks like it was published in 1977, your first mm -hmm. novel, which was a satire. Yes. And the more recent books look, and you wrote, like I said, thrillers, but it seems like most of the most recent ones have... Um, Maybe some archaeological ar archaeology at their base, even though like the the Lisa Emmers series are thrillers. Tell us a They're little thriller. bit about those books. <laughs> okay, uh, the first one was called the Delphi Agenda, and I I somebody had left a copy of the Da Vinci Code in my apartment, and I was jet lagged, so I read it in an afternoon and uh it irritated me so much that uh, <laughs> that, I'd, I'd, <laughs> that you I decided, wrote the book <laughs> <laughs> well i i started to i said this is a formula all i have to do is follow the formula and i i did about four chapters i just said okay in the first chapter some famous old guy is killed in a bizarre way <laughs> so i wrote a chapter where a famous old guy is killed in a bizarre way and uh I did. I think I did that for four chapters, and then I got so intrigued by the story I was inventing, which was really about uh, a kind of um, a re reprise of my work as a futurist uh, at a small think tank, and um, uh, I was interested in, uh, always interested in uh, the Delphic Oracle, and uh, I had a uh, I was in Greece in, I think, 2001, talking to an archaeologist, leaning over the railing, looking down at the theater. And we were discussing the Delph Delphic Oracle as the kind of CIA of the ancient world. <laughs> because they gave uh, policy advice to anybody who, you know, brought them a chicken. <laughs> so uh, I... I I did write a novel about the Peloponnesian War, which never sold. Um, but this, I thought, what if the what if the Delphic Oracle, which was closed by Theodosius the Great in uh, 395 A.D., uh, what if it went underground and continued operating? Ah, and very good. So, so that's what that's what the <laughs> that's okay. Basis of the book. <laughs> so Rob, we're about out of time, but uh, what are you working that's on right. now? I'm actually working on the third Lisa Emmer uh, book, and uh, I'm um, uh, going to after that I'm going to write a second uh, the second volume of a science fiction book I finished not long ago about uh, it's a climate change book. Mm. It's 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 about a <laughs> gather a counter gatherer world which uh, saw the dangers of technology and backed away, and they get invaded by farmers. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, I'm not so sure that uh, climate change is science fiction, but um, <laughs> but I guess if you set it on another planet, it is. Well, uh, the, way the, the, the way the farmers get here was, was pretty science fiction. So. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, Rob, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. And see you all next week on Brightest Voices.